This trader of the year, great year 2021. You have this 2019, congratulations on a great year from Trillium. All these awards, man. Yeah, and they go back a lot of years. It's insane. So it's, it's amazing that you have all these, but people will see this, people will hear this. And I want you to just share just like, what helped you get here? Welcome back everybody to Be The Trader. Today is gonna be a very special day. I'm out here in Chicago with Lance Breitstein. And if you don't know who Lance is, you're about to hear his story today. And I promise you, you're going to want to share this with a lot of traders. Lance, welcome to the show, brother. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming to Chi Town. And um, I'm excited for this. Me too, man. I've been looking forward to this since I've seen you on other shows. I'm like, man, I need to talk to this guy. And then we met Traders for a Cause this year. And that was just cool to finally put a face to the name. And so we're finally here. And what I love to dig into is just starting off for the people who don't know your story is how did trading even come to fruition in your life? Like how did it just come about? Yep, yep. So first, long time coming for this. Vegas was, was awesome as always for Traders for a Cause. And so the way I got into trading uh, was, was just kind of by chance. So uh, my parents, they had never done anything uh, kind of white collar like that. Uh, and so for me, I went to school out at Indiana University. I was studying business and I didn't know what I wanted to do really, but I just knew I wanted a job that like, like, like paid well, would I be able to support myself? Like, uh, you know, we were always growing, growing up, worrying about money and all that. So I'm like, okay, I just want to be successful. That's all I care about. And, um, there's many ways out there and like entrepreneurship seemed cool. There were all these different paths. And so I think it was around my sophomore year. Uh, maybe I just bought some book off Amazon, which was kind of like the, <laughs> the new thing back then. And uh, I started to read about the stock market and, and it was just fascinating. And just the whole concept of the ability to compound money over time and everything. And once I read that book, that same summer, I bought the Market Wizards books mm. uh, by Dr. Jack Schwager. And like so many other traders that I've met since, that was game over for me. The second I read those books where it's just all these interviews with top traders, you learn there's so many different ways to beat the market. You uh, learn about people doing quant studies. You learn about people just emotionally being the market and all these different things. When there you are in school learning the efficient market hypothesis that you can't beat the market. And so it was this amazing thing where the more I learned about trading, all the ethos seemed to really, really speak to me. And the thought of, of financial freedom and the ability to test your, your wit and your psychology and your emotions against everyone else out there, it seemed like almost this intellectual uh, battleground where there's a lot of different ways to win. And so then for me, I knew I wanted to do trading. Then for a lot of people, you, you might look at sales and trading at some of the, some of the, the big banks. You might look at uh, prop trading. You might look at quant trading, all these different things. And so what I knew is I wasn't some, some, some rain man with math. I was, I was good, but, but not a genius. I wasn't some programmer. And once you're not a programmer, all these things, it starts to cut out some of those roles. Mm. And even with the sales and trading side, I didn't, I don't like getting dressed up. I don't like all the FaceTime stuff. I don't like a lot of the, 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 the BS of the, the bureaucracy and all that. And that really left prop trading. And when I found out about that little niche, it was just like, wow, like this is exactly what I'm looking for. It was, it was uh, meritocratic, like the, the better you do, the better you get to keep. And um, in, in the day trading world, there were, there were only a handful of firms out there that were pretty reputable. Mm -hmm. And I ended up going uh, to Trillium, which was one of the kind of longest standing, most reputable prop firms out there. So you went straight there right out of college? Yep, yep. So right after I was lined up and, and that was it. That's insane, man. Because I, so what happened? Like you jump in and was it immediately easy for you or was it like, how did that process start for you? Yep. So when I was doing my, my due diligence or, or DD as the, the, the kids like to call it now, uh, all I really cared about is what percent of people make it um, because you always got to be scared of like the bucket shops and the chop shops that are just churning and burning through people and not just if you make it but if you make it just how well can you do right does success mean you just end up making an investment banker's salary anyways mm -hmm. does success mean you can do multiples of that does success mean you only make 70 grand so i tried to get a real firm idea of that probability curve and what that would mean 
And once I knew that there were people out there, um, I mean, the failure rate's high in the industry, right? Like even yeah. working at a top prop shop, I would guess, I would guess maybe maybe a third to a quarter of people, um, only those few succeed at all, let alone go on to, to greatness. Yeah. And so I knew the odds were stacked against me, but I knew if there's people winning, uh, as I like to say, like, why can't that be me? Like, yep. and, and what I was confident in is I just knew I would outwork everyone. And like, you would, you would have to pry my dead body out of that door um, because I wasn't gonna give up and I was gonna just, just outwork every single person there, no, no questions asked. And so I ended up, I think representative of that thought was uh, there was a satellite office in Princeton where one of the best traders probably ever and certainly for one of the best for the firm uh, had had been trading because he he had a couple kids and all that, and he was kind of done with the city life. And most people they wanted the the sex appeal of the big mm. city. They wanted to live in, in Manhattan and and have the social life. And and for me, I I didn't care one bit. It was the biggest no brainer of of my career to go work with one of the, the biggest best traders out there. And um, you know the salary back then was twenty six k. So I took my 26K and all my student loan debt and I, I moved to Princeton, New Jersey. And um, it, was, it was, who knew it was gonna be a huge struggle, but also one of the best, most rewarding paths that I could have ever happened upon. What was the, when you say it was a huge struggle, because I know people are gonna hear this and they're gonna be like, well, for him it was easy, you know, but then you say it was a huge struggle. So what was hard? Like, it, did it take you, how long did it take you to actually kind of see something that worked for you? even though you had someone like that helping you out? Like, was it like easy right off the bat? Like, can you tell me a little bit about that beginning stages of learning from someone yep, like that? Yep, so what I'm always very public about is <clears throat> I struggled big time. Like, I didn't even think I was gonna make it. My first year, I was negative every single month. And um, I was working my butt off, right? So you see, like for the first time, most people that enter the field, they're probably someone that's, especially at a top firm, you've probably had success in all areas of your life. So it's very foreign to be going all in, full bore, and just yeah. wait a second, like why am I not cutting it? Wait, this is odd, this hasn't happened to me before. And I think a lot of people that have only had success in their life, like if you go to some Ivy League school and if you have some great upbringing and you've, you've never failed, I think a lot of people enter the prop world or the trading world and all of a sudden the market doesn't care, right? You're competing with the pros, there's, there's, there's no easy mode. And what happens is you get people that have never experienced failure. And I, I, right, I went on to train you know, dozens of people. And so I've seen this play out so many times where you get people that haven't ever met failure. And then when it hits them in the face, mm -hmm. they don't know how to act. They don't know how to compose themselves. They don't know how to push through and, and persevere through adversity. And, and like I said, I think what separated me, at least one of my competitive advantages was my grit. Mm -hmm. And so I, I wouldn't say that none of that stuff bothered me because of course it's gonna, be emotional sure. to you and, and hard in the moment. But like, I just knew like, I am going to, every single day I'm gonna work my ass off. And I saw this guy, right? Yeah. This guy next to me, you would see him make, you know, my, my family's annual income in, in like, a, you know, on like a good day. And you'd just be like, holy shit. Like, I don't care what it takes. Like, I am going to do everything I can to take advantage of this opportunity and leave nothing on the table. So you're there learning from him, right? And we're gonna call, you know, when you're, can we give him a name? Uh, I'll, I'll name? let him be anonymous, so we'll call him Sam. Sam, so you're here with Sam, right? You're learning from Sam, and as you're learning from him, you're trading for that first year and losing every month, right? So help me understand, like, because a lot of people are gonna be like, you know, you're learning from someone really good, you should be successful right away. So can you explain that, that differentiation on why it was still tough that first year for you, even though you had someone teaching you something? like? What was it like? Were you not like learning his strategy per se, or was he just kind of giving you like kind of like an idea of how to think? Like, how was that process, and why did you feel like it was okay for you to go through those many losses? Yeah, I mean, so, so these are complex questions. Um, so, I think some people just are kind of naturals to certain things, right? There's some people that are going to be able to pick up a golf club and right off the bat hit 150 yards, 200 yards for some reason. And then there's some people that won't even, you know, they're going to swing six, six inches above the ball. And so I think I'm very much a very reflective, a very slow, intentional thinker. Mm -hmm. And for the style of day trading we were doing, it was shoot from the hip, super high speed. We were the fastest humans out there. Mm. And so to connect all these variables in real time, 
Like it was drinking from like a fire hose, right? And and he was an open book with all of his strategies. But you're like, this is a guy who's the master of his craft, and like, it's almost the equivalent of like watching Tom Brady play a game and being like, oh, you know, you just got to do that. And you're like, <laughs> you're like, what? I don't even know how to hold the ball. And like, for me to hold the ball, I need to like consciously be like, okay, this hand here, you know, this yes. across the seams. And so I think it just took me so long and my learning method was so different. And like, so I think what eventually happened and as, like, as I like to say, is what I really specialized in is, is meta learning. Mm. And when I was struggling, I, I took the mental time out and I took the time to figure out what's, what's going on here. Like I've never failed at something. I'm putting all this effort in, why isn't it translating? And I would start to do all this reading on like, how do you acquire learning or lessons or skills and everything and and that's the subject of meta learning and so what became apparent and a lot of this became the basis of a lot of stuff now seems obvious that yeah. wasn't really obvious over 10 years ago sure just in performance uh sports in general um you know everything like getting the reps uh stuff that's that's talked about in town is overrated stuff concepts like the the, the malcolm gladwell ten thousand hours which is based off of paper <laughs> by this guy Erickson. And I started to go into those papers and like learn about like deliberate practice, learn about getting these reps in and really figure out like, okay, like I'm very systematic. I'm very reflective. Like what's going to work for me? Okay. I need to study these things. I need to get reps. What is the easiest thing I can study? Right. And this is the stuff I tweet about these days. Like what are the easy money trades? What are the best ways to get reps? I've done a video on like the highlight reel. So I started recording my screen, right? Mm -hmm. And not only did I record my screen, but each week I would clip it down to like, okay, each day, there's really only a couple, maybe a couple big trades each day, zero to two trade, big trades a day. And so I would just get the film of those couple minutes. And at the end of the week, I'd have my highlight reel. And then I'd be in on Sundays and I'd in high detail write up every single play and I would just be watching them again and again and again and again. And so now here's the thing, the same way Tom Brady watches tape, if you're spending your whole Sunday watching, watching these plays, you just end up with this mental database. And so what would happen over time is then a play, right? Nothing's, nothing's what makes trading hard is nothing's ever the same. All these variables mm. differ. It, it, it rhymes, yeah. uh, but it's not the same thing. And and I'd be able to just make all these analogies and say, oh, ABC, this sell-off is just like XYZ three weeks ago. Or ABC is just why, uh, just, just like, you know, DEF eight months ago. Yep. And I would, like, in no way do I have a photographic memory. I don't even think I have an above average memory. But what would happen, and, and the people around me would be like, holy shit, I can't believe you remember this stuff. Yeah. It's not because I have good memory. It's because I was just imprinting the stuff in my brain by doing the detailed write-ups, by reviewing the videos. And so then in real time, you start to piece it all together. Mm. You know, if you're Tom Brady and, and, and okay, this, this player's moving here, like the, the defense is, is kind of making these tweaks. Uh-oh, I, I think they're going to blitz. You're able to read those little nuances because of all that time you've done. And in the same way, it's like, okay, wait, I recognize this play. This is, this is how I think it's going to pan out. Mm. And you don't have 100% certainty, but you know your odds. And once I was able to replicate those easy trades, that's when things started to click. You know, there's so many things I want to dive into, but one of the things is I really want to know what was Sam telling you, though, through that time? Because you, you talk to him, I'm assuming, every day, right? Yep. And so, oh, yeah. like, you know, during that time, and you start to learn meta learning, you know, two questions. The first one is, so stick on the first one. Was he giving you any advice or, you know, was he telling you anything when you were losing every day? When, like, what was he telling you through that time? Yep. So I think, I think he was an incredible, incredible trader, but I think he... Teaching is a very different skill set, right? Like yes. the best practitioners aren't necessarily the best teachers and not that he was a bad teacher by any sure. means, but like I think people learn in different ways. And so I think for him to have this open book, ask me anything, I'm available. It's, it was effectively just super close mentorship, right? He yeah. was, you know, it's just the couple of us every, every single day. And so he found it extremely frustrating. Oh yeah. Extremely, extremely frustrating. Like he was in no means entertained. Like there were some, there were many miserable, miserable, miserable months. Like we're not talking like, oh, you know, hey Lance, like, you know, 
today you're an idiot, but it's all like, there was like months of like, you guys are like not on the track to make it like, you know, and like he, he definitely meant well, like he, he sure. cared, right? He yeah. cared, but like he, I don't think he had as many people want to have like the tools to just be like, oh wait, like this isn't productive. What this guy needs is, is this. And I think, I think that's what I've learned a lot. Not that I was some perfect trainer either later on. Like I had to learn like it's this, there's this very fine line of being too emotionally invested and like too frustrated and like you don't, you really need to just help people focus on the process and find their path of what works for them. So it was, I guess the best way is like, you know, he cared and he did his best, but it ult it ultimately came out as like extreme levels of frustration and hey man, you're not, you're not going to have a job too much longer. Yeah. And like I, it was, it was trial by fire and it was yeah. like. It was that wake. There was there was no no bullshitting. It was that moment of like, hey Lance, like this this, like the only reason. I mean, Trillium does a good job of giving you a long leash if if you're struggling because they know it takes. It's a long learning curve. We generally say it's a two year learning curve, right? And so they gave that long path. But I think the other thing that's important and really worth touching on is like, to some degree, I was also. I wouldn't say that I was realistically i don't think anyone would have ever fired me mm -hmm. um because and this is important to everyone in every job and every stage of their life because i was adding so much value to that group like we were operating you know as, as like everyone's of course trading their own book making their own trading decisions but like we still like helped each other out as a team, right? And so yes. I was between calling out different stocks, between calling news, between reading news mm -hmm. articles, between doing studies to find more edge. Like I was putting in so much work and helping the group. So it's like if if my salary is twenty six grand a year, it's like I'm on some days I'm making these guys twenty grand in a day, you know. So it's yep. like why would you ever fire this this set of eyes? This this you know it's an intelligent set of eyes that knows what we're looking for yep. and conceptually is getting this stuff. And so it was important to me. Like I knew, like yeah. if this guy's gonna keep me around, I, I I sure as hell better add add value. I and that's true for any job, right? And people yes. don't think about that. Like you need to add value in excess to this. And people are always like in the trading community, how do I find a mentor? How do I find a mentor? And I've yeah. been going big on that. And it's like, guys, like the question is, why should anyone mentor you? What are you doing for them? And they're like, oh, there's no way I can add value. Well, then guess what? That's why you don't have a mentor, yeah. you know? And they're like, <laughs> oh, but how do I add value? And I'm like, guess what? You're, you're not putting the time in to figure that out. So what do you expect, dude? That's why you're just, just you know, yep. just, just treading water there. And it's like, first of all, you need to find someone that's close enough and experience just a level or two above you so that you can offer them value, mm. right? And then it, there's there's no just, just playbook for this. No one's gonna give you the page, just do X, Y, and Z. You gotta figure that out. And people don't wanna do the hard work. People don't wanna reflect and say, oh, what value can I do to give, to help people wanna invest in me? Yep. Right, and then to do it selflessly, right? So many people they don't want to share their daily report card with with other traders. They don't want to share their edge. They don't want to share their strategies. But those same people then say, why doesn't X, Y, and Z, one level above, two level above, not want to help me? Yep. It's like, dude, because you need to proactively give them value. And I knew that with my group, right? And even in prop trading in general, I think trading in general, because we think, oh, we're we're this we're this one man island. We're independent. People way underestimate like the power of networks, the power of giving values to other and how it comes back to you. And um, that that is what kept me alive, right? Like, yeah. Because I, I really struggled close to two years. And and really what was so big of a deal was that I, I knew, like, I mean, I was still scared, right? Like, I was yeah. eventually I had to interview other places just because it was like, wow, this is real. I might not make it. I'm struggling that bad. Yeah. But I also knew, like, man, like, I'm making these guys a lot of money at the same time. Not myself yet, but I'm conceptually getting this. And and so there was one time even when I was getting, I was starting an interview and I spoke with, with the number two guy in the group and I told him like, hey man, just between us, like, what do you think? Like, do you think I have a shot at this? Like, you know, I, I might have to leave at some point. Like I've got student loans. I've got, yeah. uh, you know, a quality of life above 26 grand, yeah. Yeah. you know, that I'd like to live one day. And, um, and he pretty much said, like, look, like, I can tell you conceptually understand this stuff. I think okay. you really got to stick with it. Like, what you're doing for the group adds value to us. And, like, if you piece it together for yourself, it's going to make sense. Look, man, I, I want to ask you some questions about some of these things you have over here. So, do you mind if we take a walk over there Let's real quick? Let's do it. All right, great. So, 
you know, you mentioned something earlier too about meta learning, right? Yep. And when you were talking about before though, is how they were very fast on, on their style of trading was very fast and it wasn't really me meshing well with you. And then you took in the meta learning to, to help you improve on that. Did you actually completely like learn how to trade fast then through meta learning or did oh, yeah. you kind of evolve what you learned into your own, like, could you explain that? Like so, how were you able to like make that transition? Yep. So the reality is I think some of the most edge happens on the shortest time frames. And so just, just from observing, I'm like, damn, I need to get good at this. Hmm. And I, there's no way to really prove or disprove something too, too well, but I like to think I was probably one of the fastest traders out there in the world because you would see some of these order flow inefficiencies and in some of these headlines, then you can equate that with, okay, if there's some order flow inefficiency for 100,000 shares and I get 80,000 of them, right? And if you see, you know, there's only so many of these moves each week and you're getting 60, 70% of the volume on them, then you're like, okay, there's nobody else out there doing this stuff. And we're just talking about trades that might elapse in, in, in under, under two seconds, under a second, you know, stuff where someone, some offer comes low, you get that guy and boom, you're able to kick it out immediately, like stuff like that. And the way, the way I worked on that speed was just, yeah. again, through so many reps, right? So I'd have my highlight reel. And when you're brand new, right, it's imagine, imagine seeing if you're Tom Brady day one trying to watch that play laps. It's holy crap. There's all these things happening. It's, it's just overwhelming. All these details go over your head, right? Yep. So what you do is you take that highlight reel video and you slow it down. And you watch it at, call it point, point 0.75 speed or something. Mm -hmm. And you watch it a couple times and you see all these little nuances. And you see, okay, this was the intraday chart. This was the daily chart. This is what the box is doing. All the little nuances, boom. That's what, like, the, that's what that turn looked like. That's what that turn looked like or that's what that order flow move looked like. And what you do is then you just rep this. And once you've seen it at 0.75, you go to normal speed. But guess what? The real, the real trick is not just normal speed. It's if you can trade even faster than that, everything else, it, you know how when you're swinging uh, a bat in like yeah. little league where you have like the little donut on the little yeah. donut weight, then you, you kick off the donut weight and you're like, oh my God, I'm the strongest, fastest bat speed in the world. So what that is, is, is you're watching those videos at 1.25x or 1.5x and you're processing all these things so much faster. So then when you watch back at one time speed, you're like, holy shit, this is so slow. This is, this is like, do, 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 do. you know it's yeah. like it's so much more intentional and so then when you're actually trading at obviously 1x speed you're able to just process these things so much faster and so these moves would happen right and with some of these inefficiencies you got to be scared like is there news out is there not news uh, is this even a price i want is there something i should be scared of like how good are these prints how much size do i want on these prints and so i'm sure i would definitely say i was super super slow but on some of this stuff, like I was definitely one of the fastest out there. Not because that's how my brain worked. My brain's the opposite of that. Yeah. But you just train yourself so, 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 so much. And like the analogy I always give is like, imagine that first time you drove a car, mm. right? Like like 16 year old you driving a car, like all you can focus on is like right yeah. foot gas and hope you don't hit an old lady in front of you or something, right? Yep. But now, You've done so many thousands of hours probably behind the wheel that it's, you can, you can talk on the phone, you can do whatever while eating a cheeseburger and still turn while like driving with your feet or something, yep, right? Yep. And because your brain learned to process all that and that's just like what trading is, right? Mm -hmm. You're able to get all this pattern recognition where you know, oh man, if I'm on the highway and, and there's some asshole speeding up on the right side of me, this guy's probably gonna overtake me, then go in front of me in the fast lane and go, right? Yeah, and yeah. That's pattern recognition, and stocks are no different. You can say, up, oh, you know, we're starting to sell off, we're starting to sell off, market's really flushing out, maybe we're really gonna have that panic, and when it does, what, do, what are the nuances I wanna recognize when it happens? What are, when, when, when a really good bounce happens, what are those variables? When a really bad bounce happens mm -hmm. and we're not working, what do those variables look like? And, and you just watch it again and again and you systemize and write all these things down and really process it. So you, you were basically doing this every single Sunday, recording, so you record everything and then on Sundays you watch everything I mean, So even, slow even better, and right, is, is during the week, I was working a, a full weekday, right? So I mean, pretty much I'd get in there early. Yep. Um, not necessarily that early, but do the full trading day. And like what people don't recognize is all the improvement, the real improvement doesn't happen during the trading day, right? Like if, if, if you're a basketball player, you don't, you get a little bit better from the game, but where you really get better is doing the drills, mm. you know, shooting your free throws, 
um, all the practices you do, watching the tape of the game, that's where you really, really make the improvement, right? Yep. And same with the training. Like, during the day, you're, you're, you're kind of just executing. Where the real learning comes from is, is all after hours for me, right? Yep. So I do my detailed trade write-ups. I would do uh, all my Evernotes. I would do all my reading about the news stories. I would do uh, creating these highlight reels. Then especially on Sunday, I would do a full review of the week, every single Sunday. But during the week, I was still working until till 7, 8 p.m., right? And yeah. I'd, I'd hit the gym, I'd eat dinner, but I was doing, I was getting all my hours in. And you know, it's, it's crazy, like we're standing here and you have all of these just trader of the year, great year 2021, you have this 2019, congratulations on a great year from Trillium, all these awards, man. Yeah, and they go back a lot of years. It's insane. So it's, it's amazing that you have all these, but people will see this, people will hear this, and I want you to just share just like, what helped you get here? Like, cause I know you talked about off camera a little bit, but like failure and how how important that is for you to talk about. So can you hit on, hit on that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think the question's always like, should you be emotional as, as a trader? And, and people think, oh, the best traders have no emotions. And I'm not, I think there's, there's a lot of generalities you can make that just aren't necessarily true. Because I've known traders that are very even keeled. Mm -hmm. And my trainer, who was great, was the opposite of, of, of even keeled. And I think as, as the world advances on, on just skill, skill kind of progression and stuff like that, my current beliefs for now are like, you want to fully believe in the process and trust, trust in that rather than focus on the outcome. But at the same time, emotions can be used maladaptively or adaptively. So here's the thing, right? Okay. Is if I'm negative on the day, say I lose 500 bucks and I'm pissed off, I'm furious, I'm slamming my desk, I say F this, like yep. trading sucks, I hate all this, I suck, you suck, everyone sucks, the whole world sucks, <laughs> I'm gonna go drink at the bar. Yeah. That is a maladaptive emotional reaction, right? But you can also have an adaptive emotional reaction. So what if I say, like, damn it, like, I suck, uh, I at least suck right now because yep. I lost money, I didn't do the right things, I didn't make the right decisions, I wanna be better. I, I am angry, I am pissed off, I am hungry for better. Yep. I am not okay, I am not okay with failure. I am not okay not being my best trader. I am not okay with any of this. Nothing makes me more driven and more hungry to succeed than feeling these emotions. As a result of that, I'm gonna stay here and I'm gonna review and I'm gonna find new solutions and new ways so that I never make this mistake ever again. Mm. That is an adaptive, emotion, right? Yep. You're, you're using a negative emotion to fuel positive change. And I think that's where these generalities get it all wrong. Like it's totally fine to have those emotions. And so when I was struggling, I think what really, really separated me from, from most people is I would emotionally feel that pain of, of, of failure so strongly. Like the thought of me going out and grabbing dinner with a friend on a bad day, like it, it I just, can't even grasp that. All I would be able to think about is I never want to feel this way again. Mm. Those emotions were so powerful. Like, I don't want to see that guy do better than me. I don't want to see that guy do better than me. I don't want to see anybody doing better than me. I never, ever, ever want to feel what it likes, what it's like to fail. Yeah. And I would do that just to drive me. What gets, when it's, when it's cold out or dark out or shitty out, like, what gets you to go in on a Sunday morning? What gets you to stay late? What gets you to hit the gym? And you need those intrinsic kind of motivational factors. You need those emotions to say, I'm, I'm hungry for this and I'm willing to pay this price. Mm. You know, and it's easy to say, but hard to actually do that consistently over time. Do you feel like, because I know you help a lot of traders and a lot of professional traders on a regular basis. Do you feel like, touching on the same fact that you said there's a lot of generalities that are maybe not really true, is there some other things that people say that really are hurting traders in the masses, like they hear all the time? You know what I'm oh, saying? Oh man! Like common sayings, like you know, oh, yeah. I don't know. Like yeah, there's there's so many common sayings out there that people won't just, I don't know, just objectively assess for for being yeah. true or not. And there's there's some that are true. Yeah. And and there's 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 some some that are just dead wrong, and people refuse to just take. 
And here's the thing, if, if you can't be bothered to objectively like analyze these things for the kernel of truth, like there will be people that's like the common saying, oh, you can never go broke taking a profit. Yes. Well, guess what? Here's the thing, is if you take your, tr if you take your profit every time you're 10 cents on the money, but every time you're wrong, you lose a buck 50, and you know, you're wrong, uh, you know, say you're right four out of five times, but if you're only making those 10 cents and if you're ringing the register and not letting that trade work, Guess what? Yep. You can go broke taking the profit because it's not going to work every time, right? Yeah. And like if you're cutting off your expected value, imagine, imagine, and I love the poker analogies, imagine getting aces and every single time you bet some amount that every, just to get the blinds, mm. right? You scare off every single person every time you have aces. And you're like, oh, you know, can't, can't, ever, go, can't ever go broke, can't ever lose, you know, yep. maximizing that hand. It's like, dude, you just got the bare minimum on the best hand. You didn't juice that at all, right? Yep. And so if something really good happens and you're always just up, oh, gotta take some off. Where like people have the thing there, it's like, oh, I love to, um, I love to get, get the, f the free trade or whatever, where it's like, okay, my risk was 5,000 yeah, bucks. Yeah. Once I'm 5K in the money, I'll take it off. But it's like, if you're taking off, where, with, when there's still massive positive expected value, that is a fundamentally, fundamentally just incorrect move, right? Mm. And like, look, that doesn't mean people can't succeed doing that. People will always kind of like, like chirp on Twitter and be like, oh, but so-and-so does it this way. And like, look, there's many ways to skin a cat, but there's still the objective mathematical truth. And if you're selling where there's massive positive expected value yep. because you want to cover your risk, well, I mean, that's one way to do it. You're not going to lose as much. You're going to get a free roll on the rest, yep. but you're also cutting off so much of your winners and you're not going to be maximizing your P&L, right? And I think so many people make those logical fallacies. And what I did really good about is like, figuring out what's the kernel of truth in this. Like, is it, is it true that I should be taking off and covering my risk? Or is that actually gonna, like, what if, what if I take off at 30 cents when I'm about to make three bucks? Mm -hmm. If you do that every time, you're ruining yourself, right? Yeah, 100%. And like, yeah, you're, you're lowering your variance. You're gonna have less negative trades, right. but your P and L is gonna be a fraction of what it should be. And people don't test these things. So like, speaking of that, because the whole idea of, like, they don't wanna have losses, right? So. Do you feel like, I, I, I don't know how to word this, so help me out here, maybe you'll be able to pick it up, but like, I talk to so many traders, right? And I'm working on it every single day. I wanna to get to where you guys are at one day, right? Yep. But what I've started to notice, like everyone trades different. Like you mentioned it, every, Jack Schwager's books, it all mentions that everyone knows that. Would you say like the fundamental, like denominating like fact that you need, and if you can elaborate, if you do believe this, is like, and if you don't, I'd love to hear your thoughts is like risk management. And, and like every trader trades differently per se, but like how they view risk and how they manage it is probably what makes them consistent. Would that be more factual than actual setups itself? You know what I'm saying? Like risk management is probably more important than the setup. So, so Bella and I talk about this all the time, okay. Okay, right? Cool. And this is because people overemphasize, more, more than risk management, people overemphasize psychology. Okay. And not that psychology isn't important, but ultimately there's the most important thing to even get anywhere. You need a system with edge, right? You can have the best risk management in the world, right? So maybe my risk management is I always take off at the right stop, yeah. right? I never lose more than I'm supposed to. I always follow my limits. If you have good risk management, but you're playing a system with negative expected value, bro, you mm. have a 0% chance of winning in the long run. Gotcha. Literally zero. Like, again, people will disagree, but it, it's an objective mathematical fact. If you're mm. playing a negative expected value system, like think about it, I can tell you I'm gonna go to Vegas, when we were in Vegas, I can tell you I've got this little blackjack system, so obviously I've got negative EV in Vegas, but I can tell you I'm never gonna lose more than 500 bucks a day. I can tell you um, on the big trades I'm gonna bet 200 and this and that, and I can have this perfect system for risk management. Yep. I can follow it to a T, but if I'm playing blackjack in Vegas, it doesn't matter. I'm mm -hmm. gonna lose money in the long run, yep. right? So I would disagree with that. That's not to say it isn't important, right? Okay, like, gotcha. But ultimately, what so many traders say as poor risk management or poor discipline or poor willpower or poor uh, over trading, ultimately, you just don't have edge. Yes. And so many people, you need a system with edge, right? Mm. And you can, so here's the real test. Can you have a system with edge, but poor risk management and still succeed? 
Absolutely. Yeah, like in some worlds you might blow up, absolutely. But there's some people that are at least going to do well and at least over like a decent time frame, right? Yes. And like, yeah, maybe you have an outsized loss, but you, if you have enormous edge, so now think about this, right? Let's say, let's say I have a 99% chance of winning mm -hmm. and when I win, I'm going to make 100x what I lose. Incredible, incredible, insane edge. People right. take that bet all day. I can have shitty risk management, and let's say I say I'm never gonna bet more than 500. If I bet 5,000, 2,000, 10,000, I can do that and still probably never blow up within, within reason because I have so much edge, yep. right? 100%. And so even, even with my trainer, he didn't have the best management, risk management, but he still was phenomenally successful. And for most of my career, I didn't have the best risk management either. And I was still putting in, I was still putting in top 10 finishes even with poor risk management, because my system had so much edge. Mm. But it can't work the opposite way, right? And yeah. so people way underestimate, do you actually have a system that works? If not, forget psychology. Stop reading psychology training books. Stop reading all this crap. You need to find a system with edge or everything else is, is useless. You will not have a single chance. Mm. And that's not true for any other thing, right? Yeah, I love that you said that. And if you don't mind, I'd love to see you know where you work at every day. Do you mind if we go Sure, let's day? do it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so I really wanted to see your setup over here because you know you hear all these traders, especially on social media. I mean, you know how social media is like you'll hear social traders saying like, "Show me your set, like show me your your desk, your setup." Like, do you feel like it's super important? And I know this is kind of general, but like that traders have multiple monitors that like they need all this, or can the trader have some success with just like just you know one monitor? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I think going crazy with the monitors and the screen yeah. layout and everything that's something that probably a lot of traders can just use as like oh i'm doing all this work that right. i think is super productive when it, in reality it's not the most effective thing you can do yep like there's the number of traders with six screens and zero edge is probably you know way 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 higher than the number of traders with one monitor and a lot of edge um and like yeah you do reasonably need room for your charts and everything else but like the monitor and screen layout, yeah. way, way, way less. In the ranking of things, it's it's down by 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 ground level. Would you say as a beginner, like, would you mostly just focus on like, I don't know when you first started or when you're helping new traders coming up in the prop firms? Because I know you help all different levels. Yep. Like, let's say more intermediate or amateur level. Are they? Is it more important for them? Maybe you know, before we wrap this up, to maybe focus on like just one ticker and just focus in on that and just trade that and instead of trying to focus on like three, four, five tickers, like what would your advice be around yep. that? So I think, I mean, I think there's pure day one yeah. where it's like, okay, I don't know what a bid or ask is, oh. where it's like, okay, like, yeah, just, just type up whatever stock you even know, Apple or something. Yeah. And sure, we can look at that. But I think as quickly as possible, you want people to start gravitating to in-play stocks. Because the reality is if there's a universe of 5,000 stocks, yes. I mean, there's probably even more, but 99.9% but .9 of tickers are probably noise on any given day, right? Like if I were to type up Sirius or something, you know, let's face it, Sirius probably isn't doing bullshit today, right? Yeah. And if you focus or fall in love with a certain ticker that's just not in play, it's you're just fooling yourself by randomness, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I work with some of these new traders, a lot of them will, will, will say, oh, this is the concept, and they just, you know, let me type up as many tickers that I, I can just kind of like squint and piece this to. When re yeah. in reality, you need to just go to the tickers that are in play because okay. that's where the edge is and that's where the real patterns, the real volume, the real emotions are. And if, if, if you take the absolute best traders and if you give them crappy tickers, yeah. they're never ever going to make a dime. It doesn't matter how good you are. If you, if you don't let me choose my tickers, yeah. I will lose every, not every day, but I would lose half of days, more yeah. than half of days. I'd lose 55% of the time. So ticker selection is super it's, important. It's everything. And so even once you know this is a bid, this is an ask, this is like the level two book, once you know those basics, you really want to start directing towards people like, why is this in play? Why is this moving? Maybe it's got earnings, maybe it's got fresh news, maybe it's, it's, it's panicking or got an interesting chart pattern. Yep. Um, anything doing abnormal volume, abnormal price action, that's where you gotta be. Um, because otherwise you're just reading tea leaves and you're gonna trick yourself. Literally the Nassim Taleb fooled by randomness, you're gonna be studying, like if, 
they've done studies where you can you can flip a coin, right? And and even though it's 50-50, you might get a lot of heads, you might get a lot of tails. Yep. And like people think, oh, look, people like our brain is trained to fool ourselves into seeing patterns. And you'll say like, oh, you know, look look at this uptrend. Like, wow, we're so streaky. Then it's like, no, it's just normal distribution of, of data. Yep. And you really got to start figuring out like, okay, this is the broken slot machine. This is doing something abnormal. From, from the market and abnormal from, from randomness. This I need to at least study to find a chance. Man, dude, like I absolutely love this and I appreciate it so much, Lance. And I know people are gonna ask questions. They're gonna be like, Alex, can you ask this? Why don't you ask this? So if they have questions for you, they wanna find out more about you, can you tell them where they can find you? Yep, so really all my content is, is based on my Twitter feed of the one Lance B. And then I do, probably each month I release videos through the SMB Capital YouTube channel. Awesome, awesome. Well, look, you need to check out Lance. Make sure to check him out on Twitter. Check him out on SMB Capital's YouTube because he produces some great content. And again, brother, thank you so much, man. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for being a fan of the show and watching to the end. To give back to you all this month, I actually reach out to Falcon Trading and we're going to do multiple giveaways this month. Here's what we're doing. We're going to give away a computer. We're going to give away a docking station, which basically turns your laptop into a computer station, a monitor mount that holds multiple monitors. So for those who have the dream of having that massive monitor station, we got you covered. And multiple $100 gift cards to lucky winners. All you have to do, click the link below. It'll show all the details of the prizes and the rules so that you know exactly how to win.